Hello and welcome to Engineering with Live. And uh, yeah, everybody that is here now is part of my experiment to try out the YouTube premiere feature. I was a little bit nervous about it because um, when I was researching how to make it work, all I got was like Reddit forums full of people saying how annoying that is. <laughs> and yeah, so let me know your uh, your comments on it if, you, if you're over there watching it. And then I guess that you're not one of those person, people that um, hates them. But yeah, I'm interested to know if you think that that's something that's worth doing and under what circumstances and how to make it less annoying. So um, yeah, I guess first of all, I need to introduce my fantastic guests. Uh, we've got Nick um, Gordon, who you might remember from a live stream that we did together on wind turbine blade aerodynamics. So, hi, Nick. Hey, there is. And we've got James Carter from Vision Mobility, who you might remember from a live stream that we did on Canada's energy transition. Um, and James is an EV uh, expert and a fellow Australian, but been living in Canada for a long time now. Hi, James. Hi. It's good to see you. So, um, yeah, I'll introduce these, or I'll let these guys introduce themselves properly later. But just to get started, introduce the topic we're going to talk about today. Um, hopefully a lot of you or most of you were over on um, the video that we just premiered about my Australian EV road trip experience and uh, in particular, yeah, like my beginner experience as a, as a total beginner and all the things that I, I learned. I definitely, you know, I've been really enthusiastic about EVs for a long time and, you know, I thought I knew quite a lot and I was surprised at how, <laughs> how steep my learning curve was. So. Um, yeah, if you didn't see that video yet, then you can take a look after the, the live stream. I'll put, um, I think I put already a link to it in the video description. Um, yeah, and a pinned comment. So yeah, that video talked a lot about the problems that I had while I was doing all that EV road tripping. Um, and especially, yeah, using public charges on the highway and in rural Australia. But this is an engineering channel, engineers are problem solvers. So I didn't want to just, you know, put a video out there that just talked about problems. Um, so that's the reason why I wanted to get these guys together so that we can talk about solutions, like solutions that exist now that I maybe I didn't know about because I was a beginner, solutions that exist in other parts of the world because Nick's in Europe, James is in North America. And then also um, James does a lot of work with EV um you know development i guess and you, you know a lot about you know what solutions are, are coming so i thought that that would be be a good good um thing to talk about with you um yeah okay so i'm keen to hear from you guys of viewers uh if you watch the the premiere of the video if you already saw it and uh, tell me what you think um, and can you relate to the experiences that I had if you've driven an EV uh, either in Australia or um, somewhere else? Um, yeah, or is it different where you lived? So tell me in the comments about that. And then I need to start by thanking the sponsor of these live streams, which is WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. WeatherGuard makes strike tape, which is a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aircraft. Um, these live streams wouldn't happen without their support, so big thanks. And the whole Engineering with Rosie channel is supported by the amazing Patreon community. So thank you also to them. Okay, so James, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and yeah, your background and what work you do with EVs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And firstly, before I get started, um, really appreciate you having me on the, the live stream channel today. It's really great. Thanks, Rosie. And, and great to see you again, Nicholas. So uh, just with some background about me, uh, my background is is with Toyota. Uh, I had nearly 20 years there working in Australia and Japan uh, and in Canada, uh, mostly on sales, marketing and operations, uh, sort of like a, a, an analytical side for uh, what's happening in those areas. Uh, I, I did spend some time with engineering. I did also spend some time out with dealers. So uh, lots of OEM experience uh, from that point of view. Uh, 2015, I left Toyota to work on my own in future mobility. And so we do consulting work uh, with OEMs. We also work with uh, other mobility companies uh, about how to, uh, what the future might hold and, and really to help them craft some uh, strategy moving forward. This could include content. This could include uh, other areas as, as well. So that's what I've been doing with Vision Mobility for the last uh, six or so years. 
Thanks for that, James. Um, and Nick, can you introduce yourself? And, um, and I should have mentioned the reason why I wanted you on this show was because um, you're a long time EV owner, you know, definitely I would count you as an early adopter. And you did tell me that you recently did a, a road trip from Oxford to Olbo, Denmark. So um, yeah, can you just tell us a bit about yourself and your yeah, EV experiences. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thanks for inviting me back on, Rosie. It was great fun last time. It's really nice to, to be here again with, with you and James. Um, my my career is as a, an aerodynamicist in wind energy. So I've been working wind energy for the past 12 years. Uh, quite a lot of that I spent at uh, Vestas designing uh, blades and aerofoils and, and upgrades to blades. And um, for the last um, three years or so, I've been working for a company called Power Curve based in, in Orbo in Denmark. And uh, we focus on upgrading wind turbines to increase their aerodynamic performance. So providing upgrade kits uh, along with uh, a number of digital services and, and consultancy to help operators get the most out of their blades. Um, but in my private life, I'm definitely an EV enthusiast. Uh, I've been driving EVs for about six years now. I started off with, um, with a Nissan Leaf and, and I had a couple of different iterations of that. And then last year, uh, I switched over to the new Hyundai Ionic 5, which I've been driving for the last uh, nine months or so, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, yeah, really keen to discuss some of the parallels and, and differences of our of our recent uh, long trips. Yeah, cool. Um, I yeah, there we go. That's a photo from from your trip that you that's sent me. So yeah, on the that's... wild west coast of Denmark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's always wild to me when people are driving on on beaches. You can do it some places in Australia, but not any of the beaches near where I live. And um, yeah, it's uh, I guess it's a long long flat area. Why not drive on it? <laughs> yeah, we we took cool. it on because we we wanted to barbecue a bit of a uh, bit of fish on the beach, and we thought it'd be nice to just drive onto the beach uh, with the barbecue in the back and um, and set up. I it think in. it was like, uh, no, no, no. Uh, it was a little that would little be cool because I've tried. In Europe, everywhere in Europe, you can buy these little like aluminium foil trays with charcoal in it and then like a grill over the top and you're supposed to light that and then barbecue sausages on it. And we're Burn like, oh, well, that's so I cool. Think. Burn sausages mainly, I think. Well, no, I think <laughs> we had the opposite problem. We would have needed like to go through three of these kits to get a sausage <laughs> cooked because we thought it was so cool, but they're just not, they're just wildly inappropriate. Um, I, I don't understand them. Maybe some Europeans in the <laughs> that are watching can tell me what's the point of these things where you, you like, you can kind of rewarm something maybe, but um, yeah. So maybe that's a big, big EV <laughs> potential use case is actually getting some decent barbecuing near the beach. Cool. Did so you I wanted the, to start. Oh, did sorry. did, did yeah. you use the V2L function to barbecue the fish, Nicholas? That would have been a really good idea, actually. I was I feel quite bad now because I used old fashioned fossil fuels on, on the barbecue, <laughs> but I really should have taken my induction hop and just plugged it straight yeah. into the car. That would that would have <laughs> that been, would have been the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zero yeah, emission next, cooking. Next time for sure. That's what you've got to do. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about so some of the challenges that I had um, in the yeah in the that I sh showed in the video, and I guess the main thing was just the charging issues. I had, you know, that in the talk everybody has about EVs, people are always talking about oh, you know, my battery technology is improving and ranges are getting longer and all that sort of stuff. Um, and my biggest learning, my biggest lesson or biggest thing that I changed in my mind after doing this 3000 kilometers of driving in a Polestar was there's the, I mean, that car at least is just so, so great. Um, it doesn't need to get any better. There's heaps of range. I mean, you can increase the size of a battery or the density or the range, but you're just going to end up way longer at charges then if that's the case um you don't need to be able to drive for four hours before you plug it in and, and charge it you know like what's the difference if it's every two um you need to stop that off in any way um yeah so i didn't have range anxiety at all what i had was charger anxiety um because yeah, in Australia on the highways, you know, sometimes they're 150 kilometers apart or sometimes 250 kilometers apart. And if you um, can't stop at a fast, uh, an ultra rapid charger, they call them here, the 350 kilo, um, 
kilowatts. <laughs> kilowatts. <laughs> like half spots. Yeah, sorry. It's early in the morning for me. I would like to point that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, if you have to start, if you have to stop at a 50 um, kilowatt charger, which I did at one point, you know, like that is adding hours onto your your trip if you want to add meaningful charge. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's the biggest thing I learned. And then, um, well, some of the comments that I saw during the, the video premiere was about how important it is. So someone said ABC, the theory of ABC, always be charging. Um, make sure that you get destination charging and charge overnight. And yeah, I did eventually, well, actually my boyfriend eventually cleared out the garage so that we could <laughs> we could park the car uh, at home because it's just not some, uh, something that you need to start your trip off having to find a charger already. Um, and then I did make some pretty valiant attempts at destination charging after the first time when I didn't think about it, I just parked anywhere in Melbourne close to my hotel. Um, and I was like, yeah, well, the next day, the, the next trip sucked because I had to start with a charger and that charger had problems. Um, but I did two trips where I tried to find a hotel charger and one time there just was no charging there. They said that there was and there wasn't. Um, and then the other time it was the one I mentioned in the video, there was just some um, Tesla charging and there were, it was a public car park. So it's like, there's just, you know, two, two big petrol using utes um, park there. <laughs> so yeah, that's, um, those are my, my issues. And so I'm just keen to get your take on it. So James, I thought, have you driven EVs much in Australia? I don't know how often you're. No, you're not back. at all. So my, my EV experience was just um, in Canada. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm going to be talking a, a bit more about ca Canada than I am, uh, than I am Australia, but you know, I think no, that's good. That's there, there's, a first, there's a couple differences that's really important to point out. One, I think, um, well, well, there's several actually. One is that um, Australia has a, a very long distance between major capital cities it, um, or major regional centres, and, and we're talking regional centres that are 100 or 200,000 people. And and I think that that's a real struggle that Australia is is going to have to try and figure out how to get around. Um, you know, when when you're in North America. You have these large regional centres, uh, you know, that are relatively close together, and and you can actually drive, and, and they have the population to support, the natural population to support EVs within the, the centre themselves with with fast charging, and and I think that's that's something really important to remember. But the second really important thing to remember is, is temperature, because um, in Canada it's cold <laughs> and it, it stays cold for four months of the year, and. Um, that really impacts range. And I'll, I'll just as a rough guide, if we're at minus 10 or, you know, minus five or minus 10, you know, minus 15 area, we have at least a 50% reduction in range. So we found that when we went to Ottawa, so our car, which is a Tesla Model 3, is rated at 400 kilometers. But if we're on the highway doing 120 and it's minus 10 out with winter tires and the car's loaded up, we'll be lucky to get 200 kilometers of range. In fact, one of the road trips that we did when we first got the car was we did uh, Ottawa to Kingston uh, as one of the legs. And, and it's not that far. It's only about 170 kilometers, but we just made it. <laughs> so yeah, right. we, ha we had to drive at 100 kilometers an hour instead of 120 for about half the trip. And you know to, you know keep keep our speed down to reduce energy usage. Uh, so that is one thing of, uh, that's quite different uh, that, that anyone in, in North America or perhaps in Norway or, or somewhere else will, will understand very intimately is that drop in range that's a real problem. Uh, so, and I think the other thing to compare to your experience, Rosie, is is the charging system. A Tesla does have a very significant advantage. Um, in its supercharger network versus you know uh, other type of charging and just to remember also in north america tesla uses its own type of plug rather than australia and europe where it uses the uh ccs type 2 system so so what does that mean so in europe and australia teslas and everything else have the same plug in yeah. north america they do not but is there a, other than the shape of it, and I know I did attempt to charge the Polestar with the Tesla <laughs> Tesla plug and it fits, but yeah, it does it not. It does 
it doesn't no electrons it. are transferred yeah. yeah um but is it is it faster or, or better in some way so taking the the shape of the plug out um the, the tesla superchargers i think there's three things that are really important about them that that really separate them out one is uh, the physical amount of charges, there's just a lot of them everywhere and, and they're spaced out well and, you know, they're well organized. The second is that they're all high power, you know, all 250 kilowatts. So you pull up to one that you'll always find and it's always fast. The third thing is um, there's a lot of the charges at that location. So typically in Australia, you'll pull up and there's one charger or there's two chargers and one's broken and then one's free. <laughs> while you pull up to a tesla supercharger and there's 20 of them <laughs> so you know that, that that there's two things that's important one there's a lot to support the drivers and two there's a lot to support redundancy so if three are out you've still got 17 left so th that's really critical the the third thing is um the plug and basically the plug and charge functionality you just plug it in pull it out that's it, it just gets build straight to your credit card rather than if you pull up to a new uh, I'm sure you've ex both of you have experienced this yeah. you've pulled up to a, a, a you know a charger and then you've got to figure out oh um, my app uh, I got to put it in then I got to put my credit card in then I got to put my card registration plate in then I got to put I just you've got 15 minutes to set up before you even get to charge your car so yeah, why don't they have just credit card scanners on them it's so annoying like in it's Australia it's getting so more bad, and more it's, common. yeah yeah it is okay yeah, yeah, there's only two charging providers, really, um, EV and ChargeFox. And ChargeFox is the one that I mostly used um, for, for everything on the highway. It was all ChargeFox. Yeah. I think the Polestar just preferentially sent me to those ones um, because it never suggested an EV one. Yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, so th the apps wasn't a problem. I set up two and it was okay. And I eventually mm -hmm. figured out that my NRMA, yeah. the um, Motor Club membership, also gives you a discount <laughs> I didn't realize at the start because I saved some money. Um, but yeah, when the app didn't work and, and <laughs> they have like a little scanner thing there, if you've got a membership card, you can do it that way. But um, and I'm like trying to scan a credit card and I called support eventually. And they're like, oh yeah, no, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, well, why, such a, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah. And then you had that problem where that, you know, you, the, the app wouldn't read the car and it wouldn't charge and like, ah, uh, what a pain. Yeah. 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 And, and okay. The, well, yeah. Sorry. The, the other thing is like, Charges are perennially broken. <laughs> Do you guys find that? Uh, I, I, when I was charging my my Leaf, uh, I was finding a lot of broken charges, and that's because sort of four or five years ago there weren't actually that many fifty kilowatt char even fifty kilowatt charges on the motorway, and the network provider that was running them uh, wasn't doing the best job of maintenance. Right. I find it quite difficult to criticise them too heavily because without their initial investment in the network in the UK as a private company, there was very much chicken. Yeah. Mm. An egg situation. The ecotricity that, that built the electric highway in the UK has, I think, a lot to be thanked for for that mm. initial vision and investment. However, as the years went on, uh, the fact that they were a tiny company um, meant they couldn't really keep up with the maintenance mm. and like, upgrading the charges as they needed to be. There was only ever one or two ever at motorway services. Uh, and I believe they had some kind of monopoly as well with service motorway service contracts. So actually I feel they kind of became a big problem um, as, as the years went on and they were bought out quite recently and, and everything's kind of transforming now, but there was a real kind of dip in, in service level and, and availability. And that was, again, one of the reasons that made me seriously look at, at swapping the leaf because it was using the, the Chardamo yeah uh, it's system, which there's just kind of hardly any of them no. now really compared to ccs yeah yeah One i did of... notice that yeah. um the chatamo charges were much more frequently broken than the, the i was using mm. the ccs so that was that was fine um yeah and i i do we'll talk maybe a bit more about um tesla versus non-tesla experience and i did actually because so many you can't write anything about a non-tesla ev driving experience online without like five thousand people <laughs> telling you that all you need to do is get a tesla so um i i personally feel I like already did it today <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll, mean, we'll, talk the, we'll talk about the we'll talk about the ionic soon so. yes yeah <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and so I, as a non-Tesla driver, sometimes it can feel a bit like um, <laughs> Tesla fans are uh, our supporters. It's, it feels a bit like a cult from the outside. So oh. I did want to check for myself and see what's the difference. So I did hire a, a Tesla. Um, oh, cool. You can hire them at, at um, from Hertz now in Australia just recently. Mm -hmm. So I hired one for or to go to Newcastle from from Canberra. So that's like 450 Ks each way or something. So I, I have something to add to that that conversation when we when we do it later. And I mean, yeah, the other short answer is yes, it was a lot better, but it definitely wasn't perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, so I just Nick, can you just tell us quickly about the road trip that you did? And um, yes. then I'll talk about some comments. Some Somebody in the the video, in the main video premiere did mention that um, uh, I'm having real trouble seeing the comments again, so I can't read out the names, but somebody said that they live in the Netherlands and they're used to charging being just like nothing at all. There's like, no, it's never a hassle in their day. And they did a trip to the UK recently and it was a nightmare. So you kind of did the reverse. <laughs> can, you, yes. can you tell us what was the trip you did and, and what was your experience with the different European countries? Yeah, absolutely. So so this trip was in, in the Ionic 5 and I drove uh, from Oxford to Orbo, which is kind of at the tip of, of Denmark. So it's about two and a half thousand kilometres uh, round trip. And on the whole, it was great. Uh, I'd never driven that far in, in an EV before because the, the leaf just wasn't really up to it um, and the network wasn't at the time. So we... Uh, we kind of saw the, the best of the car, I would say. And in the UK, I'd never been able to see the best of the car because there aren't that many high quality chargers and certainly not chargers that will enable the Ionic to go to its maximum charge, which is around 230 kilowatts of, of power. Whereas in Europe, uh, the Fastned network that I think someone mentioned on the chat and the Ionity network, uh, they are very uh, widespread and they're all sort of 250, 350 kilowatt max power. So 350 kilowatt for me is kind of pointless because I, I top out at 230 in the Ionic. But the fact that the headroom is there is is nice to know for the future. But there are just lots of them. And, you know, the, I pulled into the first charger, I think it was in the Netherlands, actually. And I plugged in the car and I was a little bit nervous almost a bit buyer's remorse was in the uk i'd never been able to see any charge rate anywhere near the advert and then i plugged in the netherlands and bang i went from 10 percent to 80 percent in like 17 minutes oh, yeah. and it was just mind-blowing and just to see that power at 220 220 230 kilowatts it was it was very satisfying <laughs> um and it just kept doing it day after day and on the way back it um it was really impressive although i have to say the temperature on the road trip was perfect <laughs> for the road trip. It was kind of somewhere between 19 and 23 Celsius ambient and a fair bit of uh, motorway driving. So I didn't have a, a, a view on the actual battery temperature, which I, I know I could have done, but I, I didn't have the, the app at the time. But I knew the battery was going to be kind of where it wanted to be. And I guess we'll come back to that later. But I was just hitting the the 18 minute super fast 10 to 80 percent. On, on every charge. The the only real issue I faced was there was a couple of times I pulled in where, as you were saying, the, my app for Ionity, as it was time, wouldn't wouldn't talk to the charger. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of people there as well having the same issue. So maybe it was a mobile network problem, I don't know. At the time I didn't have an RFID card for, for that charger I do now. So maybe that would get rid of that issue. But going back to what you were saying, James, about the, the plug and charge with the Tesla, it just makes so much sense. I don't want to be playing around with with an app. And I wanted to use the Ionity network because I have a subscription to that. So the electricity was really cheap. But you know, when I tried a destination charger in Amsterdam, there was a bank of 10 in the car park, eight were available. Uh, the app I downloaded took me about 10 minutes to set up, but it kind of looked okay. Showed all the things available and working, plugged in, didn't work move the car plugged in, didn't work, move the car plugged in, didn't work. I had to swap five times to find a charger that would work and the app would talk to. And I kind of wanted to as I was at this hotel overnight. I know I didn't have to because there was an Ionity down the road, but it's like, no, I'm here. I should be able to charge. There's all this infrastructure that's been paid for. I can't use it. So, so yeah, a bit of app issue on, 
on that was, was frustrating, but it didn't kind of affect the journey because we had so many options. Um, so yeah, we loved it. The, the car was great, very relaxing. The charging was good, but I suspected if I'd have done it in the depths of winter, it would have been fine still, but I would have seen a slower, a slower charge rate. And again, we'll talk about that later, but I certainly wouldn't have hit 220 kilowatts on the, on the peak power. Hey, Rosie, question for you. Have you driven an electric car in like an Australian summer when it's like 40 some degrees? And I'm curious oh, yeah. about what the range drop off is, is when it's really hot. Mm. Okay, I'll try and arrange an, an, another one. One day I'll, I'll, I'll buy an EV, but um, yeah, I'm not feeling particularly rich at the there's, moment. So there's, there's <laughs> I'm not sure that it's going to be by summer. Yeah. Also, so there's, there's a curve a... that Nicholas was talking about, like that the yeah, optimum okay. charge temperature is in that, like, yeah, 19 to 23 or 25 or whatever it is. And then it drops when it gets really cold and drops when it gets really hot. So, um, you know, I've certainly heard people in California suffering range issues because of uh, because of the heat. I would love to yeah. see if, if there's any OEMs or representative OEMs out there. I don't know whether you count as that, James, but just give the customer some more information. I mean, right. I'm an engineer, I'm an EV enthusiast. I looked at all the charge curves. I, I knew what I needed to know, but it was difficult to find out and I was relying on live streams, mm -hmm. uh, YouTube videos of, of enthusiasts, you know, plugging into the OBD port and mapping this stuff out. Right. And it's wonderful that people are doing that, but I shouldn't have to get it from a YouTube channel. I should be able to read it in the manual that if it's zero outside, I'm going to see 60 kilowatts tops. And then I won't be disappointed because I understand what's going on and I can plan accordingly. But if I just plug in and I expect 220, and I get 60, I'm going to be an annoyed customer. Right. I spent I spent like a, a month or so believing that the reason I was getting slow charging was because the chargers were just like on some sort of budget um, power plan and um, were being throttled constantly. It was actually, it was you, Nick, that told me, no, it's actually mm. pretty normal for the charge curve. Because I was aware that batteries, um, you can't just, you know, like charge at max, um, max speed all the way up to 100. I was aware of that. But um, I just thought if you charge up to, you know, like 80, that it should be fast and then it slows down after that. That's what I was imagining. And if you look at like, um, you know, like academic literature or general literature about batteries, not any one specific car battery, but, you know, lithium ion batteries in general, then that's the kind of curves that you see. It's like, you know, fast and then it, it, it eases off around 80%. So I just don't understand why it should be right there on the on the dashboard <laughs> it should be you know I, like I a laminated piece the, of paper or a yeah. screen that comes up when you go to charge hey this is what your charge curve looks like um because in the pollster uh, it was i can't remember now the the sweet spot because it was after i had given it back that i learned this um and i think the tesla it's like you want to get as low charge as possible to get the fast charging yeah. but in australia you just can't do that you, you can't choose when you're going to charge you know like if they're you're at a charger uh, ultra rapid charger at 25 percent, you're going to charge there because otherwise <laughs> you won't make it to the next one um so it's yeah I, I would just surprise that that needs to be information right there specific to every car just that here is your charge curve um because otherwise yeah it's like yeah. I spent months wondering what's going on you know, just share the information. I mean, as someone just mentioned in the chat, uh, Bjorn Newland. Um, yes, absolutely. That's where I learned most of the information about my EV's charge performance was by watching his videos. Um, and, they're, and they're great. Ah, okay. All right. I'll, I'll, um, I'll try and remember to put the link to that in the description afterwards. But let's get on to some comments now because there's heaps actually, which is really good. Um, so the first one is off topic, but I'd want to find out what other people think. How many think that I look like Tom Cruise? <laughs> what? <laughs> that is not someone That's, that I've uh, ever been to again. Slightly off topic. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody think that I look like Tom Cruise? He's not my favorite, but, um, Top Gun is my favorite movie pretty much. I haven't seen the new one yet, but, um, yeah. Anybody agree? Disagree? I, uh, I don't know that I want to comment on that. <laughs> I think Nicholas looks a little more like Tom Cruise. What do you think, Rosie? I 
I didn't I mean, think any of us look like Tom Cruise. <laughs> I mean, I certainly, my hair is a little bit more like Tom Cruise's than Rose's, I would say, for sure. Um, I am a man. I mean, that's in the right direction, I suppose. Um, probably taller than Tom Cruise. I mean, you can't tell now. But, um. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely taller than Tom, than Tom Cruise. I think yeah. we all are. <laughs> I think my kids okay. are as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Tom Cruise. Um, then there's a couple of people asking about hydrogen, which I'm not sure. Or maybe it's the same commenter actually mentioning several times about hydrogen. So let's just address it really quickly. Um, so UEC Energy, UK based and skipping AV to go to hydrogen because UK energy costs have soared recently. I would not recommend, <laughs> recommend hydrogen as a way to save on energy costs because um, either it's made from gas, which is very expensive at the moment or uh, and bad for the environment, or it's made from electricity it you know uses three times as much electricity as just charging your ev with electricity so feel free to wait for hydrogen it's got some some advantages but i don't know what are you maybe um i know nick you already said you don't have strong feelings on hydrogen but james <laughs> can you just in like just a 30 seconds tell me what do you think about this comment <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think I think uh, a lot of people will know my thoughts, but um, yeah, I, I think you really summarized it quite rightly there. Hydrogen is really directly tied to whatever energy, you know, there is, whether it's electricity or natural gas. And I know we all know what's happening in Europe at the moment with that cost. Uh, it, it's 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 just going to be a straight factor of those other costs. So I, I really don't see it having any advantages over natural gas or uh or electricity and and we also know that there's a, a whole bunch of disadvantages that go with hydrogen as well so uh and, and you know it's it's issues with with uh, uh efficiency is as you said and also uh, problems with infrastructure as well so there's there's a bunch of issues <laughs> is that enough <laughs> Yep, yep, that's good. Um, Non-linear dragon. I, um, Kermit the Frog is my favourite Muppet, so I appreciate your, your photo there. Um, you'll be waiting even longer for the infrastructure. Yeah, I think exactly. that's, yeah, I mean, people always talk about um, hydrogen cars and how, you know, it's a solution to range anxiety or charger anxiety, but uh, it, it maybe it will eventually be if it takes off. But in the meantime, I mean, surely you're going to have much worse range anxiety in a hydrogen car because no. it's mean, the charger anxiety trouble. that you mentioned is that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, let's move on from that. Um, yeah, a lot of people uh, this is uh, James Grover. This is this is a basically the you know the, the number one point that I guess that I took away from my experience. He says a really good fast charge network on the main roads is a must. That means car batteries don't need to be so big, which cuts the overall weight of the vehicle and <laughs> decreases charge time as well. Because that's what I realize. It's uh, if I when I go to buy an EV now, I'm not going to be looking for the biggest battery. I'm probably going to be looking more at, um, you know, like a <laughs> the fuel efficiency uh, miles per gallon equivalent or, you know, um, I don't know if there's a, a, a metric that people talk about with with EVs, kilowatt hours per kilometer or something. Um, yes, that's, what I would say that's is, is a, yeah. as an aerodynamicist, um, it's really important, even more important with an EV than than an ICE car, to have a low drag coefficient for the car. And I think that's something that, that there's lots of things that Tesla have, have got right over the years, and one of them is is focusing on on the CD of the car. And, you know, drag is uh, proportional to, to speed squared. So when you're on the highway, it makes a massive difference if you've got 10% lower drag. And um, before this live stream started, we were chatting about that amongst ourselves. And um, I really like the Ionic uh, 5 that I'm driving. But as an aerodynamicist, I, I would like it to have a lower drag coefficient. They've worked on it. They've got some neat little features like uh, auto opening and closing ventilation grills to bring down the drag uh, when you when you don't need the cooling so much. But fundamentally, it, there's a lot of styling decisions been taken with that car and sizing decisions that mean it just isn't as slippery uh, as like the Model 3, for example. Um, there's a nice yeah. uh, paper about some CFD on it, but you know, it's, yeah. it's a difficult baseline. <laughs> well, I think Look, looking at issues... it, it doesn't doesn't look so so sleek yeah. <laughs> well, one of the issues too is compared to a model three you know it's an suv versus a car and yes. so the frontal area is is quite a bit larger it's just a, a function of, of of that as well 
Absolutely. I mean, something that uh, uh, I think could, you could make most cars more aerodynamic, even seemingly simple things like having uh, more coverage of the wheels. And I know there's other issues to work around with stuff like that, but um, so much of car design is driven by styling. Uh, okay, I kind of get that to an extent. I want the car to, to look good. But on the other hand, some of it's pretty, pretty arbitrary and pretty subjective, like style the car slightly differently and say 5% drag. And we are talking about those kind of numbers some of the time from styling decisions. And that to me is almost a bit unforgivable from an engineering perspective, if you're trying to, to make a really good car, particularly a really good EV. Especially on pickup trucks in, in North America, which are just starting to get out, out there. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, an area of major improvement. Like, I don't know what that F-150 Lightning is, but it can't be any better than 0.4 or 0.36 or, you know, something around that. You know, it's compared to the point, I don't know, 2.2 on a Tesla Model 3. Yeah. And I say something you can't get away from with the size, but um, some stuff just changed the styling a bit and, you know, re reap some benefit. Yeah. Okay, just a couple more comments. Richard Newton says, as someone who lives in an apartment, EV ownership is much less practical, discuss. So I, I think definitely that's the case in Australia. But I think that they've just, just, just agreed to change um, building standards for new apartments so that every car space has to have EV charging. Um, so that should come soon. But obviously, you know, there's going to be a long, a long lag between, you, you know, um, apartment buildings that are just starting to be developed now. Um, it'll be a long time before everyone lives in one of those. Um, you can't get general, away from the fact it is an order. <laughs> um, but there's a, it's one interesting technology someone mentioned in the chat was like induction mm. charging. Uh, so wireless charging in, in the streets. And yeah. that could be quite helpful, I think, particularly like in Oxford, narrow streets, double parking, um, some more opportunities to charge if you don't have to trail cables around the place. Yeah. I was wondering, I mean, in Australia, nearly everyone lives in a freestanding house. And so it's not like, it's a problem for people that live in apartments for sure. But um, there's plenty of people who will have no trouble charging over, over home at night, um, yeah. over night at home. Um, but I was just wondering what about people, I would have assumed that in Europe and, you know, some of the bigger North American cities that they had sorted that sort of thing out. But is that, um, no. no. Still, still a problem. Yeah. So uh, okay. I'm going to make some make some comments here um, because you know this is something that we've done some work with with both uh, utilities and OEMs as well. Um, it, it is a difficult problem, uh, and, and the reason it's difficult um, it, it's it's less difficult for new builds, but it's it's much more difficult for current builds because the amount of you, you have to typically get a fair amount of power down there so you have to figure out how much power do you need then then you have to go back to the, the service in and figure out figure that out then figure out it, it, the transformers in front of the apartment it, it's it's an expensive mess <laughs> frankly and and the there are few ways to get around it uh easily and, and you know, people are working on it, but it, it's something, if anything that, if there is anything that really needs government support and government funding to make work, it's this. This is a, a really, really difficult problem. And, um, you know, I think it's a real barrier for for adopters for, for apartment buildings. And, and you know, we, we talk about, oh, you know, maybe um, it can be fixed with fast charges, but really... Not really, because it is more inconvenient because the time's longer, uh, and and so it, it's it's really quite hard. So what we we hear a little bit about is this idea of right to charge, and really it's this this focus on saying, well, you know, really we need charging infrastructure where we live and where we park, because you know we know that that's what happens when you have a house and a garage and a driveway, you plug it in overnight, and and we need to really be able to support. Uh, people with that to be able to get to the, the condo building boards, uh, to be able to, you know, have solutions that fit and work and are compatible uh, with with whatever electricity system is. And, and maybe they we have to look at ways to balance that load or maybe it's just level one. 
but you know we need to figure out a solution so i 100 percent agree this is a big problem yeah one thing i noticed is like um when i was you know wanting to find a hotel in, in sydney for example and yeah there's some public car charges that um <laughs> Sorry, I'm super tired this morning. Um, there are some public car parks that have charges in them. Um, and, you know, like normally if you're going to Sydney or, you know, other big cities, you're not necessarily going to have parking right at your hotel. You're going to, you know, park your car and then you're going to walk two, three, four hundred metres to your hotel. But then do I need to go back again to disconnect the car once it's done and, and right. move? And then what happens if it, you know, like there was a few times where charges would stop and start several times and yeah, I'd need to actually physically go out and um, yeah, restart it. And then that's super annoying. So uh, like if I lived in an apartment, I wouldn't be really excited to have to move my car every time that it finished charging. I mean um and also you know if there's only a few spots available you go to park and there's not one free at that time and you know you then you got to keep on going back and checking until you find it happen to find it free it's it just it changes it from you know everyone always talks about the inconvenience of charging just like oh how long does it take to charge but it's fine once it's charging you go yeah do something and that like no no one really I, I didn't really care how long it took to to charge if i had something else to do but when you have to keep on checking back to find a, a spot and if you have to you know keep on going back there if it's a dodgy connection or you have to go back when it's charged to move it somewhere else that's so annoying and too annoying i think right. um yeah. in in your um comments uh, james you, you mentioned uh, level one charging i thought it might be quite good for you just to expand a little for, for the audience on you know maybe level one level two yeah totally just a little kind of explainer on on those yeah so a, a level one charging and it does vary a little bit by by country to country uh level one charging in north america is is 110 volt and and, and typically 15 amp uh which is a, just a generally a household socket uh with a with an earth plug uh in, in europe and australia it, it's probably the same 15 amp but with 220 volts so a little bit you know doubles the speed essentially uh for us on a 110 volt 15 amp we get about 100 kilometers of range or 100 kilometers of charge overnight on our tesla so for some vehicles it might be a little bit less depending on the efficiency of the vehicle um for level two it's uh, typically a, a, a 240 volt or 220 volt uh can range from 40 to 80 amps depending on, on what that is and that will give a much much faster charge so you know i think almost every electric vehicle will be able to charge overnight easily on a on yeah. a charger like that uh and, and i think that's what you have nicholas at your, your yeah. house so yeah i have a charge unit on the wall that will give me uh, it's around seven and a half kilowatts i'll right. get um off of that yeah so it's it's around it's, yeah, it's it's an easy overnight charge. Basically, it's kind of like a ten-hour charge if the battery was completely completely flat. And, and that's fine because if, even if your battery is completely fat, flat, say five percent, you can get back to a hundred percent, you know, easily. But I, you know, I I typically find that you know, like Rosie said, you're coming along twenty-five percent. You know what? I better plug this car in, and you plug it in, and you're only charging up to eighty or ninety percent anyway. So that time is not 10 hours it's probably six or seven so yeah you know, uh, that's that's our experience but um you know others might have a different a different viewpoint as well but level one not ideal but you can get by if you're not doing too long of driving or commute your, your comment about where you start the charge and, and that has just reminded me of something i forgot to mention on our road trip so i had done my research on charge curves and knew what to expect and i was really satisfied but on a slightly uh, warmer charge stop, uh, plugged in the car, rocketed all the way up to 80% as, as I was used to in about 15, 16 minutes from where it was. And then it stopped dead. The charge power went straight to zero. Uh, vents opened, fans kicked in big time. And it kind of sat there for three, four minutes at zero. And it still said, you know, 20 minutes to, to 100% on the dash. So, okay, well, I'll leave it and just see what happens. And after about four or five minutes, it pushed back up to 80, 90 kilowatts and, and finished off the charge. But I hadn't actually seen that anywhere online before oh. that the Hyundai at some points may just, it, it knows you want to get to 80, which that's, it maybe has to for the fact they advertised it. So it just 
boosts up to 80 and then just kills it. And I guess because the temperature is starting to get pretty high right. and it just wants to bring the, the, the battery cell temperatures down. But um, yeah, it was quite, quite interesting. Oh yeah, that's a good, good chart, Rosie. That's so chart, yeah. that's the one you, you shared with me that I could, I used it in the, in the video. Oh, maybe I didn't in the end, but um, I used an article anyway that I wrote. But yeah, I but heard that a... about I, Ionic people. It's all over the internet. Like, what's what's going on? My charger just stopped. But um, yeah, it's an Ionic thing. It like goes breakneck pace, and then it needs to stop and have a rest before <laughs> before it. Yeah, continues. yeah, exactly. I mean, it yeah. was still it will still give you like 80, 90 kilowatts even at eighty five plus percent charge. It's it's super impressive, but it may just need that little yeah. pause once you get to eighty. But this is really interesting, you know, the charge curve, and this is something that we were saying earlier, should be kind of uh, mandatory for the OEMs to show. And we've yeah. got a couple of different versions of the Tesla on here. And you can see they get at 250 kilowatts peak power. But this this curve is such a different shape between the cars, the way that the OEMs yeah, have decided to, to do that. I think the I, I Tesla it. curve is just really not, not for Australian road trips. This right. is... You know, I was never charging in this, you know, this early part of the range, never, ever. Um, so I guess that the battery manufacturer can um, choose, design their curve to a certain extent. Um, can they? Maybe, maybe you well, know, James, but I think it's yeah, to for do... Australia, it needs to be, <laughs> needs to be here. The peak needs yeah. to be here. <laughs> well, I think for really for most, most, most people, it's better in that area. I, I think it's more to do with the voltage system on the vehicle itself. Uh, you know, the the Ionic allows 800 volt while Tesla is still 400 volt. Um, so they're achieving a lot of amps down low, and perhaps uh, it's to do it's to do with that. I'm, I'm sure there's some battery experts and some electrical engineer experts out there that can really help us out <laughs> here. So, mm. yeah, okay. But it's fascinating. Um, I, I mean, I think these are two sort of. Yeah. Pre premium EVs and yet that charge curve is wildly different. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't have the Polestar on there, but um, that's that's different again. And it, I mean, it it only yeah, it could take up to one mm. one fifty. When you're getting one fifty, that feels very fast. I don't I don't think like I wouldn't probably be looking at different when I'm choosing a car. I'm not going to look at you know who's got the highest peak charging rate. That's not, by mm -hmm. far not the most important thing. I think. You know, if you've got like 150 for a, a long, a long time, then that's great. Um, yeah. yeah. And then what, one what other was thing. Peak you uh, saw on your Polestar. Uh, I saw it go quite close to 150. I didn't oh know about charge curves not properly when I was driving it, so I didn't get a chance to really interrogated i took a lot of photos of the charging um to be like oh you know i'm usually getting like 60 or 80 kilowatts what's the point of it you know if you're getting 60 why did you even bother stopping at ultra rapid um you know when you could have had in australia the a lot of the 50 kilowatt ones are free um you know why why not just stop it there more it's a very free. valid point like but, just in particular now yeah. electricity prices as they are uh, and for the ultra fast they can be very expensive electricity prices um, yeah. If you plug in and you don't know that you're only going to top out at 70 or 80 because of where on the charge curve, you could be yeah. wasting an yeah. awful lot of money. And that doesn't seem very fair either. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, that, that's a question too. Is your billing on time or kilowatt hours? It was all kilowatt hours for me. On, right. Because um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still on time here. And, and so that's a real um, issue that Nicholas brings up. Uh, so, so you pay more if it's charging slow. Oh, Correct. <laughs> Correct. You get absolutely nailed. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Does I, it okay. encourage well, people to unplug earlier? So obviously, uh, uh, particularly when I had the leaf, a big problem that I had with mm. other charge users was people sitting there at 85, 90, 95% are getting like 12 kilowatts mm. from a 50, yeah. 60 kilowatt peak. And yeah. I was sitting there in the cold late at night going, do you really need to sit here for another 30 minutes to get another 10 miles of range? Right. Can you not let, and um, that, that was a real issue for me. <laughs> and the yeah. person's disappeared and yeah. Yeah. Was... yeah. yeah that but if you don't know, you don't know, you know, and right. I think, yeah. Yeah. I, I actually came to hate free charges for that reason that people just go charge to a hundred percent while they're at home nearby or, or something, you know, just to save some um, dollars. We don't have any yep. free charges, unfortunately. So. 
<laughs> I think it's better, honestly. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I, it's not so good. Um, I did want to share another comment. Um, yeah, from James Grover again. It might be mobile charging options in the near future. Until then, on street charging. Is mobile charging a thing anywhere now? Is it going to be a thing? Mm, what? This is interesting. Yeah. This is actually very interesting. Um, and and there's, a, there's a few issues that we're going to talk, I, I want to talk about here. We, we actually did a study on one. Um, there's one here called Spark Charge in, uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, the US. And, and uh, so startup, that's basically what they're doing is they're bringing a bunch of batteries on a, a dolly together you wheel it up to the car and you plug it in and you can vary the amount of batteries but but really the problem with batteries is they're heavy and and they're not very portable and and so while it's kind of an okay idea you can really only charge you know get 20 or 30 kilowatts in maximum at a time it, it's a bit of a cumbersome solution uh and, and then there's other problems too like you know where is a vehicle parked what, what if it's parked on the street where do you get this big clunky battery and and, and then plug it in or, or what if you're in an apartment building and how do you get the truck down there to charge it up so it, it's a it's an idea uh and i think it's not a bad one for an emergency use case like you know nrma or aaa here in or caa here in canada you know sure you, you get it you get 20 miles in range into the car and then go find a charger but as a, as a a day-to-day a -day proposition, I, I think it's a difficult one and a costly one, and I, I could see it not being profitable. That that would be my issue. Yeah. Do you have any comments on on wireless charging, James? I, I know there's been a few pilots around the world with mm -hmm. you know pretty fast, like up to 100 kilowatts. I think I've seen. On a, yeah. On so a related question to that about max uh, speed yeah. of charging yeah. via an induction. Point yeah. So so induction. So induction has a couple problems. Um, I, I'm more of a conductive fan, so uh, you know, and, and most of my work have been companies who do conductive charging. Um, and, and there's a couple reasons why. I, so basically, the big issue is alignment, and you have to be extremely precise between the top pad and the bottom pad, because otherwise, if you're off, the charging efficiency falls off a cliff, and therefore the amount of charge you get in falls off a cliff. And and we're talking really, really precise, like plus or minus an inch, you know? Right. And I don't know anyone who can park within plus or minus an inch, front or back and side to side. Like, who can do that? Certainly not right. me. So, you know, I think that that's a big issue. Um, you also have to put the pads on the car and the pads on the ground. And then you do have some EMF problems that you have to put shielding around both under the, you know, on top of the car and, and underneath. So the reason uh, EMF, uh, so, so that's, if, if you don't have that shielding, you start to heat up stuff around mm. the car, around the thing. So if, if it's concrete, you might start heating up the, the rebar steel in the concrete, oh. which could cause a problem or nails in a garage in a wooden garage. That's not going to work. So, or parts of the car. So that when, once you add the shielding, you add cost, you add weight. And, and the third thing that's really important, um, is no OEMs are doing it. There's trials out there, but it, you know, when we think about the problems that we're having with infrastructure, just to get the infrastructure going for conductive charging, you know, and all the issues that Rosie described in her video and that I've had in my Tesla, and I know you've had when you yeah. had a vehicle, we start at zero and do it all again. <laughs> oh, no, no. So, you know, I, I think that that's the big issue that, you know, I see with Charlotte, you know, wireless is we have to start again we have to start with a new standard we're starting from scratch and and to me it's just like oh no <laughs> so that that that's the issue it's gonna that. need um self-parking capability right to get these really tight tolerances and i mean you yeah. wouldn't want to you know get 50 percent efficiency because you're you know so far right. off the target yeah, and yeah, then you know it's going to be hard to get to get enough power for everybody's EVs once we've got, you know, a big rollout anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It, so. it's, it's the standards thing that kills it though. That that's the issue. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay. There's just one other topic I want to um, raise from the comments and then I'll get onto some of the, the other, other ones that we had planned out cause we're, we're running very quickly out of time. 
Um, this one from, uh, I don't know, I guess this is a Dutch name, Jan Klaas. I don't know how to say double A in, in Dutch. Um, or maybe it's Danish and it's Jan Klaas. <laughs> um, buy an EV where the battery is emerging cooling liquid because it's way better than than air cooling. And I did want to talk about cooling because that's one of the things that I noticed um, the difference between driving a, a Tesla and the Polestar. I think I know that the Tesla, like when you're, it knows you're about to charge and it will tell you that it's doing, you know, something, getting the battery ready, which I assume is warming it up or cooling it down to the right temperature. Um, and uh, someone told me, I haven't actually verified that, but someone told me that the Polestar or other any other manufacturer doesn't do that. Um, is that something that you know about, James? There, there's and two issues here. To, there's two issues to split up here. Um, and and I, I think what you're talking about and what they're talking about are slightly different. So okay. um, with, so there's a way to, so basically batteries need cooling and warming because they're like us. They like to be kept at, you know, 22 and 23 degrees and, you know, then we're happy campers. But uh, there is a one way to do it is with the older or well, Nissan Leaf is, is basically just use air. And, uh, uh, you know, your Leaf that you would have had, Nicholas, uh, had that. And yes. it's, it, it's, it's basically while the, the water, while everything else generally has some sort of glyco or, or water cooling, like Tesla's have it, almost definitely sure the Polestar has it. Basically everything else has it. And it's kind of like the difference between switching on a fan to cool you off and switching on an air conditioner. So that that's how I would I would liken it. Uh, so that the that cool the air conditioning system or, or liquid cooling is far far more efficient and, and far far better for heating and cooling the batteries up. And so what the sec I think the thing you're talking about, Rosie, is is what's called battery preconditioning. So it what it does is it sets the battery at the optimum temperature for, to to get that fast charging uh, going, and and so when you're charging in in a temperature that the battery likes, it, it doesn't really matter. But if you're charging at zero degrees Celsius or forty degrees Celsius, then there's going to be issues, and the battery is not going to be a happy camper. So what it does is it prepares the battery to you know, it cools it down, it warms it up to be at its, its optimal level when it's charging. And the way that it happens in a Tesla is that you set the destination uh, to the supercharger and it goes, oh, I'm going to a supercharger. I need to prepare the battery to its optimum temperature. And it does it as you drive there and then it plugs in and then you get your high charging speeds. So two things going on there. I'd like to see that in, in my comments. It's not a feature currently, but I did read that the next model year for the Ionic 5 is going to have that that uh, capability for the precondition based on the navigation selection. Yeah. I heard some people doing some like kind of dodgy things about slowing down and speeding up and slowing down to, try to get some more. I mean, you know, you can get, I think, up to 70 or 80 kilowatts of regenerative braking that I've observed through the meter. So that that's quite a lot, but you'd have to do some pretty hard. And then you have to say, well, the energy you're using to do that, maybe that's something you could comment on, James. So the preconditioning in the Tesla obviously takes some energy. Do you know how much energy compared to, you know? Okay. Because that's interesting, right? Because it may get you a quicker charge, but if you're having to replenish a lot of energy you've used to precondition, it's the trade-offs a little... Worse, maybe it's got to be more efficient than speeding up and then using the, <laughs> the what do you call it regenerative braking. I know I just meant like just just generally like you you might yeah. use a, a kilowatt hour or two of preconditioning right. energy. Yeah, but I suppose if you're charging 150 kilowatts, you're replenishing so quick it yeah probably doesn't matter so much. Yeah, no, no, that that's absolutely true, and and, and you know obviously it does probably affect your overall efficiency. I, I just don't know what that is. No. No, but again, because if you're plugging into a supercharger, it's, it's negligible, I imagine. But, you know, a, a kilowatt hour-ish over yeah. 30 minutes probably sounds about right, given the type of power that yeah, it takes. It's it's power probably in a few kilowatts energy. heating, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, maybe a bit more if it's heating it, yeah. That sounds Rosie, right. Rosie, I, I'll ask, I'll ask yeah. our, our, our moderator leader uh, here, <laughs> can, can we link this to a quick chat about heat pumps or did you want to talk about something else is it heat pumps in evs yes yeah, well this is what I, again if we're talking about preconditioning and liquid cooling heat pumps this and again it gets thrown into the mix of confusion 
I find. Yeah. So, yeah, so a heat yeah, pump is, it. you know, to, to heat the cabin. It's not to precondition the battery. And I think I see a lot of confusion uh, on forums when I talk to people about what a heat pump does. And it is just to make the heating of the cabin more efficient. But on a lot of cars in the UK, it's an option. And it's a very expensive option, maybe more than a, a thousand pounds. And from the range reduction I see in a UK winter, which isn't that much, to be honest, even if I'm running the heating, I would question whether spending a thousand plus pounds in a heat pump is worth that bit of range gain. And also a thousand pounds buys you a lot of electricity. So I, I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Uh, me or Rosie or? Uh, either, either. <laughs> I mean, I, I think different OEMs are doing different things. Uh, you know, I know Tesla, so our Model 3 that we have still has resistive heating. And then I think two model years after they changed to the heat pump, the, the octavalve thing, which has a habit of breaking down. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy. <laughs> I've got a resistive <laughs> heating. But um, I know that a lot of OEMs have it as standard. I think that the Ionic has it uh, as standard. I believe or on some models uh ours is resistive as far as i'm Yours aware is resistive. okay yeah but uh yeah I, the, the other thing they're a little bit noisy as well um i've noticed with friends that have newer model threes uh that there's certainly a, a noise penalty for the heat pump hmm. so i have a couple of friends who were buying i can't remember it was a skoda or a vw and they were they decided they were going to get the heat pump option because they, it was more efficient and they wanted more efficiency. And I said, but yeah, but how how much? I like, are we yeah. talking 5%, 10% rage and you're paying 1,200 pounds? And uh, I'm not sure it's an easy answer. Yeah, it, I think it, it, it really developed. I think it's really going to vary by different manufacturers, what they charge, mm -hmm. if they include it as standard, if they don't, what the option price is. Is the option bundled in with a bunch of other things? That, yeah. that, that's... I think it's almost a case by case basis that would be yes like that. i agree i think often they're bundled with a battery heater as well i think that's the yeah. case with the ionic it's heat pump Probably. and battery heater yeah. Yeah. i'm pretty sure the ionic that we have uh we had uh, an ionic for a couple of weeks just for the viewers um i'm pretty sure it had the heat pump option uh, mm. on the car that we had okay okay um a few people are asking about battery swapping so nc um says what's your thoughts on battery swapping since it seems to resolve all the issues you're having i did actually listen just yesterday i listened to one of the i think maybe it's the latest redefining energy podcast and they talked about battery swapping which i had always until yesterday i'm like that's the dumbest stupidest <laughs> thing but it was a company i think it's called um uh gogo -Go row or something Go -Go like that. Yes, yes. and it's mostly about e-bikes or yeah. um two-wheelers um but they, it, the company sounds really cool because now they have kind of expanded and they pointed the guy that they interviewed pointed out that you know like all of your um power tools at, at home electric power tools they've all got swappable batteries so on that you know on that small scale that's clearly you know convenient and, and great um, and I know that there's also, you know, for long haul um, trucks, there's people trying for battery swapping and that seems to make some kind of sense, um, maybe, or it might make some kind of sense. For cars, it seems, passenger cars, it seems totally, totally wrong and I didn't actually know anyone's doing it, but someone has commented, um, the unknown yeah. unknowns has commented battery swap um, could be a good option for people living in apartment. Neo are doing battery swaps in Norway. Um, I didn't know that, uh, I knew that Neo had um, gotten into it a bit, but I didn't know that they actually were doing it in um, in Norway. Is that something that you know about, James? Or... Yeah, so we, we've done a little bit of study on that as well. Um, it really comes, it, it's it's kind of the same problem as the wireless charging. It's the standard issue, It the standards issue. So, uh, you know, which car is going to have it, who's going to share it, the other problem is is that OEMs really value their own IP or you know intellectual property surrounding their battery development. They don't like sharing, and mm. so you know there might be some OEMs that kind of have similar batteries, but it, you know it's not just about the battery. It's it's about all the software that's connected to it, and and you know the battery you know connected to the battery pack, connected to the car. So you have to have this really broad standard and. And, and I, I don't think OEMs are really going to want to share that stuff. Um, and, you know, you start, 
not only do you have to agree on the electronics for the battery, you have to agree on the size, where it fits in the car, how it's going to fit in the car, what are those connectors like? And then you've got to build out the infrastructure. So this, again, is a standards problem. And, and, and I think that's really what's going to kill it. But, you know, with uh, Neo, Neo's the only one doing it for themselves. And, uh, you know, okay, that might work. If you're willing to pay, keep, you know, pay for the infrastructure, then that's great. I think you talked about Gogoro. Um, the really key thing with Gogoro is you can hand carry them. <laughs> you pull them up, <laughs> put it in the scooter, you put it down. You can't do that with a car. So that that's the huge advantage that uh, Gogoro has. Actually, the Japanese uh, motorcycle manufacturers are working on their own standard as well. So for the, the, the thing that Gogoro is doing, targeting apartment dwellers in Taiwan, it is just bring it. Cars, that's a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> Yeah, the, the guy they interviewed, he mentioned that, yeah, so it starts out with, with scooters and stuff and uh, definitely it makes sense. A lot of Asian um, cities in particular just, you know, have so much um, transport, so much of their transport is done on scooters. Totally. But he said that now they will license their design to um, people making those, you know, really small electric cars. I can't remember what the category is called. Mm -hmm. We don't have them in Australia, but they're in tiny ones. So, you know, they'll license their things. So someone will take their battery design and then build a, a small car around it, knowing that the, you know, the charging infrastructure or the, the swapping infrastructure is already all there. Um, and so that seemed like a way maybe around this um, compatibility issue is if, you know, they happen to have gotten in with something that has reached a certain level of, mm -hmm. um, you know, presence. Uh, so, it could make sense then for other people to to jump in with the same um, same platform and, and there's there's one company that, who so. was looking at doing this suitcase size thing and and basically it would drop out and then you'd pull a handle and wheel it over to the the station like that we have in front of us and then and then plug it in and you know it might be say twenty five or thirty kilograms and and for a small like Japanese K car that weighs only you know a few hundred kilograms yeah that might work but. Uh, you know, not when you, you know, a Tesla battery is what, you know, six, 700 kilograms. So, you know, it's, it's never going to work. You, you're going to have to have proper mechanical infrastructure for that. You can't just have a, a pull it out and, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. But I, um, I just thought it was interesting. So they've, yeah, um, I think even definitely. just the, the scooters, there's so, so many of them in Asia and um, it's, it's totally. something I, I don't, I don't know anybody that's working on EVs in Asia, so I wasn't able to get get somebody on the show to talk about that experience. And I would love to it's, do a trip. It's a brilliant a idea for, and... for, for mopeds. I don't know whether yeah. it's like uh, a mandated thing, but um, when I was in Beijing last, just before COVID, I don't think I saw a, a scooter that wasn't electric. Yeah, I don't think amazing. I saw a single one. Yeah, right. This is just a video of, of Neo now to, to show what they're doing. Uh, I haven't looked at this before. I literally don't don't know what they're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. Is it a robotic swap? Is that how? Yeah, I mean, it's, obviously it's a car robotic battery is very swap. heavy. Exactly. And, oh, wow. you know, I don't know, you know. Oh, there's your wireless charging solution. The <laughs> car park pushes you over. That looks cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Put well, that in every this, car park. How much do you think this is going to cost? <laughs> Like, this is not charger price. This is millions here. Holy yeah. smoke. And I then you got to have it. the land. It's very cool. It does <laughs> look cost effective. Uh, so. yeah. yeah. Yeah, very smart. But, wow, it's a bit more than just a cable and a box, isn't it? It, it is a little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's bit Star Wars, um, actually, Max. I think we need to start wrapping up. I know Nick is up late, so I'm up early. Nick's up late. It's all, all good for everyone in America, but the rest of us are, <laughs> are battling. Um, I did just want to talk about um, education. Uh, so, I mean, I thought that I was... 
I was well educated on EVs before um, before <laughs> I did my my road trip and I did have I, I mentioned in the video you know like I did my first leg of the road trip it all went smoothly and I'm like I'm such a legend you know like everyone says EV road trips are so hard but actually it's just you know you have to be smart like me um, and I couldn't believe how much I had to learn especially like I I was just still so shocked that I did I had never seen a, a charge curve a real charge curve before. Um, and there's so much to learn. I'm an engineer with immense motivation to learn about it. I mean, my whole career is about energy transition technologies. So, you know, I really felt like I had to do this, um, this trip. I, I feel like I need to buy an EV. I just, just struggling to, <laughs> to spend the money. Um, but your average person on the street is not like obsessed with the energy transition. They're not an engineer. They don't, they don't know any electrical engineering to be able to figure out some, you know, things or aerodynamics or, you know, chemistry. Uh, and they shouldn't yeah, have so to. I mean, that's the, that's the key thing is that they shouldn't have to. <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah. James, do you have any thoughts on how, um, how can we educate people on the, you know, the things that they need to know? Because it doesn't work if you don't educate and people, well, it wasn't actually, maybe, uh, Nick, didn't you have a story about you had your leaf, uh, you know, for a few years and loved it. And so your, your parents or somebody, somebody close to you, we don't have to name and name and shame, but somebody is like, yeah, great. We'll get an EV, and then yeah, tell tell you tell the story. It's your story. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, no, exactly. Some someone uh, we knew bought a leaf not not long after us because we loved it, and we we drove all over and went up to Scotland and you know all this kind of stuff. And um, they've had it for a few years now, and they really love the car. They love driving EV, but I think they've maybe charged away from home once, possibly twice, and because they they just found it very stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't find it easy. And I, I completely understand that because if you turn up and you don't know about the temperature thing and you don't have the right app, etc., uh, etc., et and there's three cables to choose from, it's it's not easy. So again, you know, they, they got really excited about the EV, which was great. And they do love the EV, but it's not the EV, as you were saying earlier, Rose, it's the, it's the charging. And the fact mm -hmm. they didn't feel confident in taking a long journey and understanding the charging and getting it working meant that they just didn't do it. And it's fine because, you know, 90% of the time they, they don't need to do that. But it'd be nice if they just didn't have to think about it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's, it, this, this is interesting because, you know, I think typically the three of us are probably a little bit more on the early adopter side. You know, we're interested in new technology. We're, we're willing to try stuff and, and make it work. But... But I think, I, Nicholas, you said it really well. People, average person on the street, the mainstream audience is not willing to do that. And uh, we have to make it easy for them and make it friendly for them. And, and, I, and I'll give my wife an example, and I'm sure she won't mind. Um, is she, She's more of a mainstream thinker, and, and she wants stuff easy. And even though that Tesla's the easiest thing, she still doesn't like it because she, she has to stop. She has to, you know she has to figure out how you know how long it might take even even though most of that stuff's presented and she's still not really completely comfortable with it even after three years and you know so i guess if i sit her down and walk her through it you know she's okay but you know that's not everyone has sort of someone who's knowledgeable about you know evs as a as a spouse so um you know they're the sorts of things that that really are going to you know they're the sort of people that really we have to get to a point both in the technology and the simplicity to make them feel comfortable um so yeah i, I think that's a real issue it is mm. i think in terms of the rapid charge one thing that would say is and again i don't really can mandate these kind of things but they should all have contactless credit cards yeah. on them all of them there's just kind of no excuse now that it shouldn't have a contactless port i've got uh well i'll open my phone i have seven charging apps on my phone oh, currently oh. i typically don't use them but i've got them there in case i need to use them yeah. and then i don't have to download or whatever but the fact i have that I, that's stupid <laughs> i feel like i mean it so my impression of the charging in Australia, and I've heard similar things overseas, is it's not really like if you're you want to you know start a business as um, j just building EV chargers and making money off the um, electricity that you supply, that that's a pretty challenging 
thing to get to work. It seems like most people are combining it with some other values. So, you know, Tesla spent a lot of money on their charge network to get people to buy their cars and, you know, places like Starbucks or, um, you know, supermarkets or, I don't know, any, I think Ampol in Australia, a petrol, petrol station company, they're, you know, rolling out a lot of EV charges that, because they want people to, I guess, come inside while they're, um, they're waiting to charge. That kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, I don't see all these EV charging problems getting solved through the free market alone, not fast enough. Um, and so and I think the governments are starting to, to there, there are good policy. I think there's some stuff in the US, the recent um, yeah, IRA thing um, in the US and Australia, we've got a new government and they are talking about EVs. And initially it was all just about, you know, how can we um, give people incentives to buy EVs? And, you know, after my road trip, I'm like, no, no more people can have EVs until we sort out the, the charging. Um, and I do see now people talking about charging. But if government money is going into these charges, then isn't that the perfect opportunity to say, okay, you have to be compatible with this this app because I want to yeah. see um, a queuing system <laughs> on these stupid things. I think yeah. especially in Australia, it's important. Like we're never going to have charges every 50 kilometres on the highway. That's just not going to happen in Australia because there aren't towns 50 kilometres apart on the highway. Um, I, I want everything to be able to talk to the same app and I want a credit card option. The credit card option first, so easy, surely, just say, mm -hmm. you know, if you want this government funding, then you want this rebate or whatever, you've got to put a credit card um, uh, option. Uh, there's one thing I would add to that is to make sure you maintain them as well. Because <laughs> actually yeah. one, one thing that's really important um, about the UK is the government's just introduced legislation to make sure that, you know, there's an, I think it's a 99% uptime, I believe, that, that, that it's mandated by law in the UK. And that is just spot on that's yeah. what needs to happen and you know congratulations to them for doing that because you know i, I know there was a study done by berkeley uh in, in uh the bay area they found that 25 percent of every charges of the several hundred charges they visited 25 percent were broken and that's terrible it's terrible. absolutely terrible mm. so yeah that's not a situation that we can have and that's not sustainable for anyone. And, and, you know, we have these situations where companies go in, grab the money for the government rebates, put up a charge, said, see you later. And the thing's broken like a year later and never gets fixed. So it will be interesting to see how that kind of the, the pace, state of adoption of the cars goes with the, the boosting infrastructure, because um, for me, I, I saw this huge, problem so for three years i drove my leaf i was so happy i pulled into any fast charger anywhere never anyone there often free no wait time it was wonderful and then i hit yeah two two and a half years ago and it was terrible suddenly in the space of like eight months it went from hassle-free long distance travel to an absolute nightmare mm -hmm. queuing for an hour and a half charges broken and that was the say this part of the big motivation to switch to the ionic five but mm. i just hope that we don't go in these boom and bust cycles that i experience where it's like oh everything's amazing and then six months later oh we've hit this crunch point again where there's 20 percent more vehicles and only five percent more charges and you know it's yeah we've got to keep ahead of that yeah yeah it, it'd be really cool to see that like the the sales rate mandated with the charger rollout right so somehow yeah well, I mean, one thing that you see in a lot of literature, I don't know whether so much recently, but so even government literature saying in the UK, oh, there's X thousand or X over 10,000 charges. So you don't need to worry. But you do need to worry because 90% of those are basically useless. They're even including like, you know, two kilowatt outlets in car parks that you hmm. can never access. I, a comment. I don't know it's if just it's a true. bit of almost. Oh, sorry. Um, you cut out for a second. I, uh, know I would say it's basically, 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 propag basically propaganda. You can charge anywhere. There's ten thousand charges. There's not. It's mm. just not. Is this something anyone's heard about that Germany is taking Tesla to court because the charges haven't got a CC mm. swipe? But yeah, I don't know. Because I know in um, and maybe this is the opportunity. I just, I really, I, we need to talk about Tesla versus non-Tesla. We we have already run out of time, but like you know, a lot, but it's not a topic we should probably cover quickly, but um, that is one one thing about 
uh, yeah, the Tesla network in Europe, it's opened up, I think, already, or mm. in some parts of it, at least, everybody. I've heard that they're going to do it in Australia, um, which will will be great. I don't know, maybe it's harder in North America if there's a totally different plug shape, then yeah. that's not going to be such a fast, easy transition. But, yeah, so when I hired my, my Tesla, I drove, yeah, 450 kilometers each way, um, the benefits of the tesla system were that one that there's heaps of charges at each spot so it there was never like the, they were never even half full when i went to them mm. um and yeah they they all worked i didn't have to do anything in the higher car in hertz actually if you hire a, a tesla from um hertz at the moment it's free charging so i didn't even have to pay for it so that was cool i mean i paid a lot to hire the car for, <laughs> for a couple of days it was like 200 bucks a day or something so it wasn't um it wasn't nothing um, but some annoying things were like the locations of the charges sucked and the, um, navigation couldn't actually get me to the charger. It was just like, it's somewhere around here. You're in the middle of Sydney. So, you know, like, it's not so easy to be like, oh, you've just overshot by 50 meters. Uh, it was one time it was in like a Bunnings car park, a hardware store car park, but like up on a, a, a second story oh, and uh, where is this charger? I'm like driving back and forth. I was like, it is not here. It's the middle of the night. Eventually found it up there. Um, you know, some little signs wouldn't go astray or trying to find the corner of the huge multi-story car park in the middle of Sydney. I also, one time I had to go, like on the way from Canberra to Newcastle, you shouldn't have to go into Sydney. You should be able to just stay on the highway. But I had to go into Sydney in pretty peak traffic to get to the, the um, Tesla charger. So that was all kind of suboptimal. And mm -hmm. they also weren't at places where um, like there was no, no food or toilets or anything nearby. So, you know, my other trip, every charger was at a, you know, a rest stop. And so you're doing two things with your time, but with a Tesla, I had to learn, okay, you got to pick up dinner and then go charge and you eat your dinner in the car while you charge. Otherwise you, you know, you, um, just wasting time. Yeah. So that's, or that's my own, quick... cook, cook your dinner with the vehicle to load. So. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> true. <laughs> take your own five and take your barbecue. You're good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So that's my two cents on, on Tesla. I think I, I own Tesla shares, by the way, I, I should make that disclaimer. So, you know, if anything, I have an incentive to talk, talk Tesla up, not, not down. Oh, the one other thing that drives me nuts. <laughs> there's no, um, there's no, like on the dash, there's no information there. Like the map is off to your left and, you know, on that big screen that's off to the side, that, that drove me crazy. I just want things directly on my eyeballs so that I'm not going to miss my turn off. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's my two cents about Tesla. And I know that James, you, you are a Tesla lover, Tesla lover. I wouldn't say that you're one of these like cult like people, but um, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly you're more like positive. It's somewhere under here to stand. <laughs> <laughs> but can you just uh, quickly tell me what you think the differences, differences are? Um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think what you keyed on there um, really was, was, and I don't think it's just Tesla. I think it's a, a much bigger problem uh, with, with chargers, and I think chargers globally, is what do you do when you're charging? You know, you're going to be here for 40 minutes or half an hour or whatever. What are you going to do? And, you know, it, the place needs to be safe. It needs to be well lit. There needs to be something to eat. There needs to be something to do. And, you know, whether it's Tesla or whether it's any other chargers, they, these are really basic problems i think that that need to be addressed and need to be solved and and some areas are great maybe it's at a a, a mall and you can go inside and and you know that there's food there and, and there's a washroom and, and then that's all good um but if it's just in the middle of nowhere like that experience really sucks because if you've got to sit around um you know and there's nowhere to just like it, it can be bad so uh you know, and, and it, because you're sitting around for a while, I, I know some people who, you know, especially if it's in a dim, dark spot of the car park, you know, that there's a there's a, a fast charger at a shopping mall near me and it's in the, like, the scariest spot. Like, I would never let my wife go there alone. <laughs> it's just, like, you just wouldn't. So, you know, it's, you've got to, you've got to really think about 
you know, the, I think these things to make it nice for people, particularly because you you have to sit there. And if you're sitting there alone, like, I don't know, that's that could get sketchy pretty quick. I don't know. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts? I had an experience in that Bunnings car park deserted in the middle of the night. I wasn't thrilled by it, but I, yeah, I just sat in the car and, um, yeah. 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 And also once you're plugged in, you know, you, you have to get in and out your car. Right. And you know, even at some, you know, just standard UK service station, uh, I pulled in in the leaf one night a few years ago. I felt super uncomfortable. It was quite late at night and there was a load of guys, uh, you know, with their souped up cars zipping around and kind of wandering around the car. And, you know, there was quite a lot of alcohol around. And I just right. thought, OK, I'm sure nothing's going to happen. I'm in a service station car park, but it wasn't pleasant. And I had no choice. I had to sit there. I couldn't go any further. I have to get out of the car and unplug. And, you know, there's people milling around and coming up to the car. And it was just threatening, you know. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. All right. We're gonna we're gonna leave it there, I think. But I did want to ask both of you guys um, just to wrap up. What's your What's your number one tip to make EV road trips smoother? And whether that's you know something people can do today, or whether it's a suggestion for you know anyone working on EV <laughs> charging policy to to change. I'll start with you, Nick. What What's your number one tip? Um, planning. Uh, just just planning so make sure you know the the key fast chargers on 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 the route and that you've got the the app or the card to access them and if possible it often is in europe stop one before you need to they'll, they'll often be quite close particularly in netherlands germany whatever so if you don't have to get down to five percent batteries you could stop 20 kilometers early just stop because if you can't communicate the charger or whatever, then you, you've, you've got it back. I know that's not possible around the world, but from that's yeah, kind of a policy we have. Yeah, 20 kilometres. What the hell is 20 kilometres going to well, be? Yeah. Australia, it's Australia. It's 100, 150 kilometres. and it's so, you know, if, yeah, if either my wife cool. or I forget, we, we remind each other, said, dude, let's not go to the next one. Let's just stop there. Doesn't, yeah, mm. doesn't matter. Let's just stop there. Yeah. I, okay. And James? Yeah, look, I 100% agree. I, I think Nic Nicola's captured that really well. I, I think, though, for, for my personal point of view, the number one problem with charging, and I'm, I'm going to take a, a much bigger picture of uh, charging rather than than uh, road trip, um, is I, I know, Rosie, you do a lot of road trips, um, but I think for a lot of people, they'll focus a lot more on their daily commutes and their daily you know, errands and things that they have to do, and, and road trips are maybe once every couple months type of experience. So, you know... Um, to me, there's this, this percentage of people in, in, in Toronto, at least, and, and a lot of cities that 30% of people are living in apartment buildings. And we really got to figure out that right to charge, make sure that we can have charging right where people are at. And, and I think for non road trips, this is, this is the number one problem in my, in my, for my experience. Hmm. Okay. Um, just one last comment. From David Montgomery, how about a drive to Perth? drive to Perth. <laughs> I would absolutely love to do that. And if somebody lends me a car for, I think you'd need a while because I'm imagining. I know that there is like somewhere along the Nullarbor, there is a guy with a fish and chip shop who maybe not fish, but you know some sort of some sort of fried fried food place. Um, he's got biodiesel <laughs> powering a generator that will charge your EV. But I don't think that you'll get, um, yeah, all the way across just with that one thing. So I'm imagining you're also going to need some portable um, solar panels and uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, anyone wants to lend me a car for? I probably need a, a, a month maybe to do the round trip. Yeah. Um, wow. And I, yeah, then I am happy to take that challenge on. Uh, I think that would be super. Super cool. But it has to be a normal car, not one of these, like, because, you know, Australia um, has that university competition from oh. I think it's a South Australian <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. That solar competition um, where, you know, that like they're really streamlined and um, full of solar panels. No, it needs to be a regular, a regular EV that you can buy to drive around. Um, yeah. Someone wants to give me a loan of that for a couple of months and I will, I will do that road trip and make a video about it. <laughs> Highway number one, the complete loop. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to take that on too. I'll come, I'll come pick you up, uh, James, so we can do part of it together. 
I'd, yeah, I'd like cool. to, uh, to to end on a positive thing from my side. Um, mm. I'm doing my that same road trip again in a few weeks' time. I'm I'm going yeah. UK up to Denmark again via via Hamburg for the Wind Energy Europe conference. So yeah, we talked about loads of issues, but I think we talked about lots of solutions and good stuff. And say, so I'm completely happy to do that journey again. No no questions asked. I I will also say. My, from my experience, once people drive an EV and spend a little bit of time in one, they're not going back. They're getting one and, you know, it's the stuff outside of this public charging is just so good. And I know you talked about it, Rosie, but the things they do really well, they do really, really well. So yes. It's such a great thing. Hmm. Yeah. I just enjoyed the okay. last comment we have about we've spent hours talking about rapid charging. It's very true. I could have charged the Ionic about four times in this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a comment from Stephen Brookwood. Oh, Stephen Brookwood. Um, yeah, good point. Okay, well, let's um, leave it there. It's uh, yeah, 50% longer than normal. So value for your money, everyone that attended today. Thanks, thanks everyone for watching. Um, and yeah, thanks also to WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for sponsoring the live stream. Um, WeatherGuard also have a great tech newsletter and a podcast, which I co-host every week with Alan Hall and Joel Saxon. Um, the links to that are in the description. And we talk about all kinds of clean energy tech news. In the latest podcast, we talked about a new carbon capture method. I think it's from Mitsubishi. Um, and also a big patent infringement legal battle between GE and mm. Siemens, which is going on at the moment with their offshore platforms and is very interesting to to watch wouldn't be so exciting for those involved but um yeah so check that out on your favorite podcast app or you can watch it here on youtube um also need to thank again the engineering with rosie patreon team and if you would like to join us then um this is the link which i still i need to adjust that screen so you can actually read it but the link's in the description if you want to want to join us um what else? So upcoming videos. The next one I've got to release. I uh, did a tour. Actually, the trip that I did use the Tesla for was to go up to Newcastle to see a couple of clean energy projects up there. So Newcastle is like a big coal mining area. Um, you know, its whole economy is built around coal mining, coal export and some um, coal power plants. And um, there's also a lot of really interesting clean tech going on there. So I went up and visited a couple of companies. One is an energy storage company. Um, that video will be out later. They're called MGA. Um, but the next video will be on Mineral Carbonation International. And so that's a carbon capture and use technology. You can make like um, plasterboard or um, cement additive out of it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then, yeah, next live stream, I, I did a hydrogen webinar um a little while ago and they they gave me the um the recording to share on the channel so i think i'm going to release that as the next live stream in a couple of weeks because other than that i have uh, some personal news i'm not going to be around as much over the next month or two because i'm actually about to go on maternity leave i'm uh, super pregnant uh, i don't know if you can tell because i usually just do the, <laughs> the videos from like from here up but i've got like a a watermelon <laughs> watermelon sized bump out the front of me at the moment so yeah that's going to be going to be happening um soon so i have tried to get a lot of content um ready ahead of time so you shouldn't notice too much difference with the normal videos but I can't plan ahead very well for, <laughs> for live streams. So we'll see how that's going to go. Um, yeah. And other than that, thanks everybody. Well, thanks for the people who are putting in congratulations. That's nice of you. <laughs> um, yeah, lots, lots of congratulations. Thank you. Very, very nice of you. So yeah, big, exciting change for me. Obviously it's my first and, um, plan is only child. So big, big life changes to come. <laughs> So anyway, thank you very much to everyone who was watching today. Um, and thanks a lot, Nick, for staying up late and for James for staying, yeah, half an hour longer than I uh, probably blocked out in your calendar. Um, and yeah, we'll see you, see you all in the next video. Bye. Thanks a lot. See you. Thank you. Bye.